I'm so excited that Mark and I are the first performing artists in residence at the Riverside Art Museum. This is such a sweet, vibrant, vital, important place and it's an honor to be here. It's especially an honor to be part of this exhibit, Wendy Maruyama's TAG project and the EO9066 exhibit at this time in history. It's amazing. My uh, family was directly affected by World War II. 1941, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. And 1942, Franklin D. Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, forcing the evacuation of all Japanese Americans from their homes and to forcing them to abandon their businesses. Every man, woman, and child were issued a tag with their name, a government-issued number, and the destination camp. I did a series of work called Executive Order 9066. They were dioramas made of wood, archival photographs, and found objects. I found myself returning to the tag. I realized that the tags were emblematic of the experience. So I decided that I would create the tag project. I wanted to recreate all the tags for every Japanese American that was interned during 1942. I'm a storyteller, Mark's a musician, but since the beginning of time, history's been passed down by storytellers who usually have a musician with them. <laughs> and usually the musician is somebody who plays strings. This whole project is like amazingly organic. It's one of those be here now, keep breathing and don't blink too much so that you can really see what is it that Mark and I can contribute to this community? How can we um, make the art here alive to the people here? Sacha's father stopped talking to her when she was four years old. She remembers. She said they were at Topaz, and she remembers sitting on his lap, and tears were streaming down his face. And she was saying, talk to me, Daddy. Why don't you talk to me? Sachi's father couldn't speak English, and he didn't want her to learn Japanese. So he just stopped talking to her. This kind of blows my mind. Talking to my friend, I've known him since sixth grade. And we, and we start talking about Terminal Island because Terminal Island was one of the very first um, Japanese settlements to be taken away. And Terminal Island was this quintessential fishing village, Japanese fishing village. And the people came from Japan and they made it a Japanese fishing village. And nobody lived there except Japanese and Russian fishermen. And I heard from one of the ladies that the Russian children, they only could speak Japanese or Russian at home. So it, they were peacefully living by themselves. But after Pearl Harbor happened, they were the first people that the government came and took away because they had boats and they had radios. So my friend's family was one of those families. In fact, all my friends who lived along Santa Fe Avenue, most of them were Terminal Island people. I just didn't know that. That the, the men were all taken away. Um, the government brought all the women and children to the church and the, the ladies thought that they were gonna die there. So they dressed the children in their best clothes so that they would die with dignity. 
but then they were taken away. Then they bulldozed Terminal Island, so nobody was able to get their stuff. So that's why these pictures are so amazing, because for some reason, my friend was able to keep some of the photos that his father or his grandfather must have taken. So this is them going off um, during the evacuation, and I think that's what they called it, when they put everybody on, on trains. That's probably in Long Beach. And then this is uh, his father's war location card, which says he's a, you know, he belongs to Rower. But this is the part that really, you know, is ironic, okay? So here he is, his family's, the father's family is in the Rower internment camp. Um, he is now in a segregated all Japanese unit fighting the war, and here he is. But this to me is where you have to go because if you know your past and you try really, really hard, you can change your future. So this is the past. These are fishermen with boats, with a livelihood. These are Russian girls in kimono, living in harmony with little Japanese girls. This is the way it was before. And then you get this. And what comes from this is a whole lot of self-hatred. The Japanese being the only uh, minority group to lose our language and our culture in one, in one generation. And Japanese Americans being one of the least people to do art. Because what is art? Art bears witness, right? It bears witness to life. We're not encouraged to be artists, you know, suck it up, <laughs> endure. But, but the residual self-hatred, not have, knowing your language, not knowing what came before the camps, is still passed down. And there's so many Japanese American kids who are, they're the antithesis of model minorities. They're dourly mobile. Why should, you know, I go to college or why should I worry about that kind of stuff? And it's, why is because long time ago, we tried and we got squished down for doing it. And they don't even know that that's what's at play generations later. My Uncle Sam was in the 442nd, the most highly decorated unit for its size in the history the U.S. Army. I always used to think his name was Uncle Sam because he was a war hero. <laughs> but no, he said, name's Isamu. I think they could pronounce that. They called me Sam. And we weren't war heroes. The generals were all Hakuji, white guys. They hated Japs. They used to make us do the most dangerous thing. They would bet each other, I bet you I can get my Japs to do this. I bet I can get my Japs to do that. We weren't war heroes. We were cannon fodder. What camp were you in? I went to Heart Mountain. Heart Mountains. Before we went to Heart Mountain, we were at uh, Santa Anita. The so race, race tracks. I remember my mother was pregnant oh. when during this time. So who was there? I had my mother and my father. My mother had come from a big family, so there were a lot of cousins and aunts and uncles, and we all went to the same camp. Oh, that's yeah. nice. So we were able to be together in camp anyway. Do you remember how it was afterwards? They were, had a lot of prejudice in the school bus and things like that. But yet, they were, I made some friends too. Mm -hmm. So there's always both sides that yeah. you get to know. Michiko was in turn. Where were you? Heart Mountain and Tule Lake. Heart Mountain and Tule Lake. And I was Tule Lake. That was the one. That was really a tough one, right? Yes, because I, I think my father must have been a no-no person. No-no boys were resi often resistors who thought that they should not have to go to be in the army unless their families were released. So they, they're quite.
quite brave to say no, no, actually. Sometimes it was harder after camp because you had yes. to, you know, you had to earn, earn money for food and everything, and then it was sort of uh, difficult and living. Everybody was prejudiced pre against you know, you know, to And Japanese couldn't live in most places, right? That's why so many Japanese lived with uh, Mexican people yes. and black people, because we could only live where the poorest neighborhood. Yes, yeah, right. And, and Riverside, everybody lived in Casablanca, which is uh, oh, the Mexican area, right, you know, right, or yeah. the east side. It, so. Why it matters is because for everybody else who's going to, through all this kind of stuff like DACA, and uh, I mean, the Dreamers are so much like uh, the Nisei, you know, raised here and everything. Uh, the Muslims who people are want to put in camps, why it matters is because it's going to really, really, really mess up every, this country three, four more generations down. Mm -hmm.